recent State of the Union address, there was a line in President Trump's speech that got, uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting, it got some of uh, the biggest applause point when he declared to the assembled leaders of the American government, you know, House of Representatives, the Senate, the Joint Chiefs, the Supreme Court judges, and whoever else <clears throat> I guess was uh, considered important who was, who was sitting there, but he got the biggest standing ovation and, and you know people and cheers from that standpoint from these assembled leaders when he mentioned that the state of our union is strong. I thought this was a curious statement. I really did, considering the fact that uh, uh, the United States of America is so thoroughly and so often bitterly divided. You know, willful blindness, that is ignoring the reality of a situation, does not make for unity. And I, I, in, in looking at this question, we in the Church of God are living in a time when there is great div division. Here, if we're living in one of the Western democratic nations, I don't care if you're talking about France or, you know, with its uh, gilet jaune, you know, its, its uh, yellow vests, or whether it's uh, Britain, United Kingdom with its Brexit, or whether it's Canada, well, we have, you know, we've got an election coming up in October and things are really heating up here for sure. Uh, and, um, you know, and of course, the United States, it's, it's uh, where they are. We know all the, the whole thing that's going on these days. Yeah, it's not, we can't ignore reality. We have to think about, from this standpoint, uh, the reality of our situation, how we, church brethren and, and uh, you know, people, the people of God, how we, how we function, how we're going to get along in a period like this. So we, we need to look, you know, what the scriptures have to say, speaking, and it's very important, speaking to this, you know, our state of the union, our unity in the church and among the people of God. And I want to be, I want to mention just a couple points and bring, and begin to bring upon this and, 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 and look at this, uh, you know, examine a little bit of this question of unity. Now, the scriptures do speak that there are consequences consequences for any nation or people when sin becomes, you know, prevalent. The really, the, it really does. It has an effect. And this division that we are seeing throughout much of the Western world is because of sin. Make no doubt about it. Let's go. The Bible does talk about that. There are consequences. First Kings, let's go to First Kings chapter 12 and verse 16. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible version. And it's talking here in this, uh, breaking into this uh, particular scripture, it's talking about how the confederation of the United 13 founding tribes of ancient Israel, who had, you know, they had their capitals in the city of Jerusalem, and they, they were ruled by the dynasty of David's family. At this point in time, when the scripture comes along, you'd had David, he'd, and he, then you had his son Solomon, and then when Solomon died, he had his son Rehoboam. But Rehoboam, you know, wasn't a perfect guy, and the people weren't all that happy with Rehoboam at that time. So it says here in verse 16, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16, so when all the ten northern tribes of Israel, I'm reading here in Amplified, saw that uh, the king, who was Rehoboam, Solomon's son, did not listen to them, okay, <laughs> and he, 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 he had put a lot of tax on them and duties. Hey, I, I think that the taxes probably going on in many places now are far higher than uh, this time in Rehoboam. But anyways, when, when these northern ten tribes of Israel, they, they saw that the king did not listen to them, the people replied to the king saying, what portion do we have in David? That is in David's dynastic family leadership. What point do we have in this country? It's not our party. What portion? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. David was the son of Jesse. That's referring to David. To your tents, O Israel. Now, you know, in other words, we're out of here. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they were saying, okay? You know, using, uh, they, most of them didn't live in tents by that point in time, but it was a literary way of saying, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to pack up and leave. 
You know, just like you would imagine a Bedouin family packing up everything, loaded it on the camels and the donkeys, and out they go. Well, they were saying, you know, to, to your tents, O Israel, we're going to, we're gonna, you know, we're splitting. We have no inheritance anymore with this uh, political situation you've got here. Look to your own house, David. And then Israel went back to their tents. In other words, they left. The nation broke. There was a division. And it was because of sin. We don't need to go over all the particular sins at this point in time. But, you know, the, the point was, is that you had, when the nation divided, there were going to be consequences. And there would be consequences, of course. Why, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, again, I want to say, you know, what, what are some of the sources? So, some of the sources of division? Well, Jesus addressed that. Let's go to... Um, Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. At another time, Jesus was casting out a demon. And, you know, he'd lead us, you know, he had said very clearly, you know, Jesus said, there's, you know, there's demon, there's devil, you know, there, there are the personifications of evil, real beings, okay, who, who do have their influence, who aren't friendly. And it was controlling the man, so it was making him mute. And when the demon had gone out, see, Jesus cast him out, spiritual affair, Jesus having the greater the power, the mute man spoke and the crowds were awed. But some of them said, you know, there are always a few there. They're going to be the wise guys that are going to say, Ah, Jesus, he drives out demons by the power of Satan. Beelzebub. Okay, there, you, you do one thing and, you know, they say, Ah, he's only doing it, you know, by the power of Satan. That's really a negative perspective. But anyways, that's the one they took. The ruler of demons. And, you know, he, he, this was, uh, okay, this... Okay, come on here. This was, from this standpoint, when they looked at this, this, it was something that Jesus did that was good. Again, this is a form of blasphemy, being, you know, that you are saying, we have to remember, there is, Jesus talked about there was an unpardonable sin. As blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is saying that something that is good is a, no. It's not good. There, blasphemy says it's not good. It's bad. It's, it's not. It's not pure light. No, no, no. It's it, it's rather you know it's darkness. So, these people were saying that Jesus had cast this demon out, and that he was only doing it by power of Satan. They were, they were twisting what he did and the significance of what he did. Back to Luke 11, verse 16, others trying to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. You know, there are a lot of people, you know, what is, you know, is, is, is God up there? Is, is, God, is God real? Of course, God says very clearly in, in the scriptures, he says, well, my creation is proof of my handiwork. He says, sure, then I'm here. But we'll go on, verse 17. But he, well aware of their thoughts and purpose, because he knew he knew where they were coming from. So he saw where they were coming from. He said, every kingdom divided against itself is doomed to destruction, and a house divided against itself falls. Abraham Lincoln would later quote this during the Civil War. When the Americans did divide and turn against each other and fought each other, and what would become the bloodiest, still the bloodiest of American conflicts, Far more Americans died in the Civil War than died in World War I and World War II combined, and all of Vietnam and everything else, which is a rather sobering thought. Every kingdom divided against itself is doomed to destruction, and a house divided against itself falls. This also can apply to the Church of God, or any church. It can, it, can, it can also apply to families. Verse 18. 
if Satan is divided against himself, okay, they had accused him of, you know, they said you were, you, you were operating by the power of Satan by throwing out this demon that was making this guy mute. If Satan is divided against himself, Jesus is asking, how will his kingdom stand and continue to survive? Okay, if Satan's working at cross purposes, you know, what, how, how, does, how does this work? Now, if I drive out the demons by Beelzebub, but by Satan, by whom do your sons drive them out? Okay, because there are other people who could throw out the demons too, righteous men. For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I drive out the d demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has already come upon you or has come close to you in, in the person and presence of ministry of Jesus Christ. Who was, who was there at this time. So he's saying there to those who were opposing him, he said, hey, you know, if I'm, you know, like, look at, the, look at, the, look at what's happening. Look at the fruits. Jesus was at that point trying to bring this people who had knowledge of the scriptures because most of the people he was talking to, the people he preached to, most of them were familiar with the scriptures. Of course, that's quite different because today there are a lot of people who haven't a clue. They, they, don't, they don't have the beginning because our nation, uh, many people, and they have families and individuals have, 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 not been, have not heard the word of God at all. Maybe there are more down in the United States of America who have a, you know, a passing acquaintance, but it's less up here in Canada, still less in places like uh, Britain. Anyways, unity takes work and leadership. And sometimes the making of hard choices. If we go to, in the Old Covenant Scriptures, to the prophet Amos. In Amos 3.3, uh, 3, a very famous uh, scripture here. The way the King James Bible, I like the way, because it's a little old-fashioned, but I like the way they put it because it, it's, 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 it stands together very nicely. Prophet Amos, you know, speaking on God's behalf, says this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now it works in church con congregations as well as, you know, political parties and anybody else from that standpoint. Can two walk together? Can they, can they walk together except, you know, they make an appointment to get, sit down and say, this is where we're going. They have to have an agreement of this is what the goals is. This is what we're working towards. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, interestingly, would take Amos's uh, Amos three three, and he would expand upon it this topic. It, and he did this in one of the more famous New Covenant uh, uh, passages of the Bible in Galatians chapter five. Let's go to Galatians chapter five and verse sixteen. Galatians five and verse sixteen. So I stay with the Amplified Bible version here. Paul is saying, and he's writing to the church, okay? And this was composed of, of mostly people who were not of Jewish background in Galatia. And there's more to the story of Galatia, but I won't get into it. But anyways, Galatians 5 and 16. But Paul said, but I say, walk habitually in the Spirit. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature. What's he talking about? You know, first of all, Paul's concept of this sinful nature is which responds that that part of most some human beings or most human beings responds impulsively, without regard to God and His precepts, because. These are people who have not had a background in the Judeo-Christian morality and ethics. So, so they respond impulsively. But he's saying that if you walk in the, habitually in the Spirit, the Spirit of God, we'll get to that in a moment, then you will not carry out the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature has its desires which is opposed to the Spirit. And the Spirit opposes the sinful nature. For these two... Okay, the sinful nature and the Spirit of God are in direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict. They're continually in conflict, so that you, as believers, do not always do the good things you want to do 
because you've got this conflict going on, even within yourself. Sometimes, you know, it, it, our life is much easier if we're unified. We say, you know, I, I'm not divided in my goals. I'm not divided in what I, how I want to live. I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I don't have these different parts of me pulling me somewhere else. When we have, from the standpoint, a spiritual, very clearly a spiritual that you have the sinful nature and then you have as opposed to the spirit. See, you have a division. There is a division because there is a contest in this world between that which is good and that which is evil. It manifests itself for individuals and it can manifest itself in communities in the politics of a nation. So, you know, this is sort of like a state arc, or you know, the presence in this, in this, of, uh, of, of this world at this point in time. Verse 18, Galatians 5, verse 18. But if you are guided and led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law, that is, subject to the law's condemnation, because you're not living a habitually sinful lifestyle. Because a habitual sinful lifestyle, as defined by the scriptures, has a con you know, the consequences of that lifestyle is, as, as Paul would say in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And that means you're, you know, death is the opposite of immortality. <laughs> it's a cessation of being, of consciousness. But if you're guided and led by the Spirit, you're not subject to any of the condemnation of the law. You don't, you're not going to be subject to the, the, the wages of getting back of the wages of sin, which is death. Now, the practices of the sinful nature are clearly evident. And what are they? Paul says there's sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, meaning a total irresponsibility and lack of self-control, idolatry, sorcery. You know, we're talking not just witchcraft and occult practices, but we're also talking about, you know, witchcraft, the way the, the in the biblical times he was involving drugs, altered states of mind, hostility. Okay, this is, you know, this is where strife, jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, you know, all sorts of the selfish ambitions that promote divisions. Verse 21, envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior, and other things like these. I warn you before, just as I did previously, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, okay, say so you have these things over here that are, that are negative, and they cause divisions and factions, dissensions of all sorts. On the other hand, fruit of the Spirit, which is the result of God's presence within us, is love. You know, that unselfish concern for the good, the welfare of others. Joy, inner peace, patience. It's interesting, the Amplified says, patience is not the ability to wait, but how we act while we are waiting. Patience. How we act while we're waiting, while we're waiting for the kingdom of God to appear. It's not here. But in the meantime, how do we carry on? How do we live our lives? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's, you know, there's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because the law is designed to facilitate. The law of God is the written word of Scripture designed to facilitate and protect the opportunity for God's Spirit to, 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 you know, work fruit in us, to perform the good work among individuals and families and even whole communities. When we live according to this, you know, to the way that this book has, then we have a chance to have these things grow. Yes, and by, even by extension to whole nations. You know, one of the things... You know, when, when, when God took ancient Israel, he had a purpose for them as a nation. He had a purpose for them as a nation, and they needed to be unified in that approach as a nation. 
which of course, as I've mentioned already in citing the scripture in First Kings, they failed at it. You know, they got their eyes off the mark, off the goal of where they were trying to do. They forgot what they were doing and ended up fighting among themselves because of it. Exodus 19 and verse 5, expanded Bible version. So now if you obey me, God said, this is before the Sinai covenant was made. He said, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession. That's a special treasure chosen from all nations. Even though the whole earth is mine, God says, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That is, they're, they're being set apart by God to serve as an example to the rest of the nations, to bring them, as, as, as clearly mentioned in Genesis 12, in the verses 1 to 3, when God talked to Abraham, he was, the, you know, he, this was the Abrahamic covenant when he started this relationship because of his point of, he wanted to have this unity in the spirit that would extend through the whole world. And he wanted to, he, he, you know, ancient Israel had the opportunity to, to be, you know, a, a footstep in the point, a, a, a useful tool in the hands of the maker, of the creator, in bringing the earth into this unity. It will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You must tell the Israelites these words. Yeah, Moses told them, but of course they didn't get it. Later on, the apostle Peter would, you know, after uh, would you know take up this theme one more time. But the, when when Peter looked at it, rather than looking at ancient Israel, he was looking at ah, he was seeing that it's the believers in the church, the the people in whom the Spirit dwells, who are going to be. The, you know, who, who are going to be this priesthood. Peter said in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen people, royal priest or priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, people who belong to God. You were chosen to tell the wonderful acts of God. You know, to tell about the wonderful acts of God. That's you know, really, that's the purpose of the priesthood at this time. To everyone else, we're to tell about the wonderful acts of God, who proclaim, in the way the expanded Bible says, to proclaim the praises and virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his wondrous, marvelous light. So our work as priests in God's holy nation requires you know, it should require, you know, well, it does require, but it should foster a unity with those whom we work with and whom God's work with. You know, it, fostering unity in this world, this point in time, it takes work. It takes leadership. Because there is always going to be opposition, and sometimes it makes, you know, hard, you know, it makes making of hard choices. It was for the good of eventual good of all. But this is not easy. We're living in a time of great national division, strife and rancor. But you know, in, in spite of this, the, 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 the context, the environment that we're social environment that we are living in, we've got to remember this exhortation, you know, as Paul put it here, if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter four and verse three. Ephesians 4, 3. Make every effort to keep the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Each individual working together to make the whole successful. Make every effort to keep the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I mean, he talks about it in a different, you know, turns it on its, you know, on its side and looks at it one more time from a little bit different angle. And in Colossians 3, 14, Paul says, and I'll, I'm quoting here from the English Standard Version, and above all these things, put on love, which is the, the word here that we translate into English for love is agape. 
It's referring to put on God's divine love. Put on, which is what God prefers. It's God's moral preferences. We put those things on. So it's a question of priorities. Our unity, if we, if to, you know, to preserve the oneness of the spirit and the bond of peace is if we're putting God first and his priority and his moral preferences first, we will have peace far more. You know, as opposed to what we have at this point in time in our society where there, you know, there isn't, you know, the, the reason why you don't have unity, the reason why you have uh, disunity is because there isn't this commonality of willing to put God's preferences first, to, to do these things. So put on love which binds together everything in perfect harmony. So when we have, when we put, when we have, you know, or willingness to follow and to act on God's preferences, then we have unity. We will have unity in the church. We'd have unity in our families. We'd have unity in our communities. We have unity in our nations if we have that preference. But of course, we don't have that now, do we? No, we don't. But nevertheless, we, you know, we're living in the society we are. And God, he gives us uh, the scriptures, give us a notable illuminating example of how in some ways a community of God's priests, that is part of this holy nation, ha would operate um, at a time when there was such disunity. And how you know, does one work at binding together God's people in harmony? It's very interesting how, how, how God did this, how he operated this. And I want to look at a little historical example here, just one, just to give it a, a, a it's, it's an interesting part of scriptures of how this worked. Perhaps we can understand a little bit more. Here we are in the 20th century, 21st century, of how perhaps we, you know, the kind of, you know, situation what God's people went through before. You know, so that we can learn from that. All right. You know, one of the things that we look at in when we, you know, how do we have unity in God's church? Well, one of the, one of the first things that occurs, it's very interesting, that the, one of the first things God does when he wants to create a, a group that's going to be unified, he does what? He sorts them into two groups. <laughs> one group of, of those who will and the one, another group of those who won't. I suppose that's not too surprising. Let's go to Ezra, in the book of Ezra. Now the context of when, this, of when Ezra comes about, you see, we, we read about, first of all, the division there in 1 Kings, how the kingdom of Israel that you know, and from the David had established and unified kingdom of all the 13 tribes of Israel. It had broken apart because of sin and it had become divided. And later on, each of those kingdoms would fall to outsiders, to enemies because of sin. Because people didn't make it, you know, a, a priority to choose God's moral preferences in their lives. And so eventually God made let them be slaves of outside powers. Now, you know, one of these, so when we open up Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1, we hear this is a period of time, it's at Babylon. It's after, you know, this is a long time, Nebuchadnezzar has come and gone, and the, the Jews are still there, and they're captives of the Babylonians, and the Babylonians eventually fell to the Persians. A new kingdom came in, you know, killed the Babylonian leaders, except for a few, like Daniel. And then, you know, time goes on, God has a plan. See, he's always working to plan. He's got, he's got a narrative that he's working from beginning to end. But so Ezra 1, in, in verse 1, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, which is 538 B.C., 538 B.C. At least two generations after the children of Israel had been taken captive and hauled off to Babylon. 
the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Notice how it was. God stirred. See, when Ezra in writing this down, God stirred. He moved this political, Gentile political ruler. An Iranian, we would call him today. <laughs> I love it. You know, if we could get the Ayatollahs to, to you know, do something good. Anyways, God, to fulfill the prophecy, he stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom, his empire. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Jerusalem, which, which is in Judah. So here it is. Yeah, this, this Gentile king says, well, you know, I've got it in my head pretty square. I've got to build this temple. The God in Judah, of course, historically, we know he, you know, the, we have the Cyrus rule. There is the archaeology archaeological evidence. Yes, this did happen. It was something that was real that came about, remarkable and astounding as it may sound. Interesting, isn't it? It is the truth. It's reality. Verse 3, and so he said this, all right, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build them a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Okay. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. Okay, you've got my permission. You can get up and leave. You can go back to the land of your ancestors, the land that was promised to you, according to the biblical narrative. Go ahead, you can do it. And of course, you know, when you have something that Babylon... You'll have one group say, why should I leave Babylon? I've got it good here. And others would say, no, you know, you know, somehow also God would work with them. And as I said, you know, the idea, is, you know, in God seems he sorts people. People are sorted into two groups, those who will do and those who will not. Jesus himself taught this principle, okay, in Luke, let's go to Luke chapter 6 and verse, verse 43. Luke 6, verse 43. See, it's not enough to call yourself a Christian. There's more to the story than this. A lot of people these days call themselves Christians, but what does it mean? Again, who will do and who will not? God sorts, and, he, and Jesus himself put it this way, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? You know, Jesus, Jesus, but do not... Do what I say. I will show you what everyone is like who comes to me and hears, that is, listens to my words and obeys. That is, he, they act on them. So he's saying he, he wants us, he gives us his word, he wants us to act on it. That person is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. You know what, builder? My own house is, is built on a rock. <laughs> I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't have it built, but the builder who came here, built here, he, you know, there is a, this place has an enormous rock. <laughs> you know, the, the basement is, you know, he, he had to right up against it. They dug deep and laid the foundation on rock, and when the floods came, the water tried to wash the house away. You know, you think of any number of pictures you can think of, uh, just even in the news this week. The, you know, the floods came. It, it rained in California. What was it? Sausalito and this house comes crashing down and smashing into another one. Was it built on the rock? Guess not. So that it's, it, tr it tried to wash away the house, but it could not shake it because the house was built well. Verse 49, but the one who hears, that is, listens to my words, okay? They, you know, this, this was especially true at a time when more people would go to church and they go to the pew, they sit there because it was socially expected of them, okay? Not so much these days. But the one who hears or listens to my words and does not obey or act on them is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. Then the floods or the river came and uh, swept against it and the house quickly fell. It collapsed and was completely destroyed. So he's saying, you know, there, there, there are a couple consequences. 
if you hear my words, you know, you should be doing them because then it's going to be, it's going to be far better for you. You'll have good results, but if you don't, it collapses. So let's go back to Ezra, Ezra chapter 1 and verse 5. So Cyrus says, okay, anyone who wants to go up and go back home and leave Babylon, you can. Ezra chapter 1 verse 5, amplified. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites and all those whose spirits God had stirred up. See, God has a way. He said, oh, these, I'm motivating. They arose to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is Jerusalem. An interesting thing, the Hebrew verb for arose or to stand, depending upon the translation you're using, stand up, is often a command that is to get ready to fulfill a command. It's, it's, it's an instruction, you know, like to get ready to fulfill a command, somewhat to a military command, attention! Okay, we're, you know, we're, we're getting ready to do something here. All those whose spirits God had stirred up arose to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So all these people, attention! Okay, who's there? Okay, oh, all right, let's go. And they did. And in those days, it meant, for most of them, it's, it meant, you know, loading uh, your household possessions or at least what you could take, you know, some things you'd sell, but, you know, put it on the back of a donkey and off you truck, <laughs> you know, hundreds of kilometers through the desert. Maybe you got, if you were rich, you got to ride on a camel or something. But anyways, it, um, you know, before the sorting out had occurred, of course, in Babylon, all the Jews there, you know, they were doing their own thing. There was, you know, they were doing what was they wanted to do and whatever they felt like doing, you know, doing, doing all those things. But, um, you know, so they, but when they, when they heard this, when they heard this instruction to, that called them to attention, then they had a, a sense of unity to go out together. And of course they had to go together for their own safety <laughs> from that standpoint. You know, I mean, there were bandits. Even today in the Middle East, I don't think I'd want to walk and carry my household possessions or even put it in a pickup truck and go from one place to another on the road by myself anyways. I think it's just, I think it'd still be very, very dangerous in this aspect. Now, as I, you know, mentioning, so first of all, God sorted people out. You know, who was willing to do his will, who was not who's willing to build on the rock, who is not. The next step of unity is having, you know, a vision of the goal of to act together. And we see they understood that they were going to rebuild the house of the Lord, which was in Jerusalem. In other words, you know, this was to publicly start up the worship of God, which had not been, you know, had been left off because they'd been hauled away as captives, as a captive people. It says here, Ezra chapter 3, and we'll start with verse 1. It says, by the seventh month, so they went back. Um, you know, they were going to establish to their ancient promised land to publicly restart the true worship of the Bible's God. And it says, goes on, and they were making progress. By the seventh month, the Israelites had settled in their towns. So they came home. They had settled on their inheritances, and the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. They were unified by a common purpose of the worship of God as specified by the scriptures. They, the reason why the seventh month it would have been Feast of Trumpets, the beginning of the fall holy day season. Then you would have had the Day of Atonement and then the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says, Yeshua, son of Jehozadak, and his brothers, the priests, along with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers, began to build the altar of Israel's God in order to offer burnt, burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses. So they were following, they knew what they had, it was there. In, in the scriptures, the man of God. And they set up the altar on the foundation 
on its foundation and offered burnt offerings for the morning and evening on it to the Lord. And, and then it makes this comment, even though they feared the surrounding peoples. Because it was dangerous. Because there were all these other people, you know, in, in all this intervening time, time, they had come back. You know, Cyrus had allowed them to come back, but there were a lot of people who wanted their, their land, who, who didn't want them back in their, in, their, you know, in their possession, their ancient inheritance. The scriptures then go on here in Ezra to talk about that there would have adversaries. As soon as of God's people, yeah, they, they did it. They, they went back, they marched across the desert, they got into, they settled, and they, they set up a, an altar and started worshiping God again. And the next thing that follows is what? Adversaries. People who really didn't like what they were seeing. Ezra chapter 4 and verse 1, Amplified Bible. Now when the Samaritans, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, heard that the exiles of the captivity were rebuilding a temple to the Lord God of Israel, okay, they said, oh, all right, we've, we've got our competitors coming, trying to come back here and giving us a hard time. It's like, you know, Pal Palestinians looking at uh, Israelis saying, ah, oh, you want to settle on this place that your ancestors used to live? They came to Zerubbabel, who is now the governor of the returning exiles, of the Jewish exiles from, from Babylon. They came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the fathers' houses, okay, to the leaders of the returned Jews, and said to them, okay, let us build with you, for we seek your God and worship just as you do. And we have sacrificed him since the days of Eshaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Okay, so that was uh, about 680 to 669. So somewhere in the neighborhood of about 150 years earlier. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the father's houses of the Jewish exiles, households of Israel, said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. But we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel just as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. It's got nothing to do with us about this. Because, of course, they weren't unified in the same purpose. They would try to tend it off some other way. And they realized they didn't need to have that problem in their community. It says here now in verse 4, Ezra chapter 4 and verse 4, then, that is the Samaritans and the others who, who were there, uh, the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them to deter them from building and hired advisors, lobbyists, to work against them and to frustrate their plans during the entire time that Cyrus, king of Persia, reigned, and this lasted even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This would be some 17 or 18 years this would go on. Now remember when the, one of the fruits of the Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. <laughs> it's not just waiting, it's what you do while you wait. But for a long time, it says here in Ezra chapter 4 and verse 24, it concludes here this chapter 4, is in the adversaries came up, showed up, as you could well imagine. Then the work of the, on the house of the Lord in Jerusalem stopped and it was suspended. You can expect, whenever we try to do something as a people of God, that there will always be adversaries at this time. This is not the kingdom of God yet. Second Timothy, in the New Covenant Scriptures, Second Timothy chapter three and verse thirteen. Apostle Paul here, as in the in the role of a prophet, he was warning Timothy, and through him, us today in the church, he said, "But evil people and imposters." 
will flourish. You see, just as the time of Ezra. And they show up, hey, let us get in this. Evil people and apostles will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. We see that going on right now. You know, uh, people are, are deceivers and they're, you know, and they're, they themselves will be received, deceived. We have all sorts of stuff showing up in social media these days that fits this. You know, people who are set up, oh, we're going to show up some, you know, some bad people. And they just, it's plants. It's just fake news, literally. But Paul said to the church, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. We must, you know, we must remember to, it's because we have these things in common. We, we choose what God prefers. We must continue with that. We must patiently continue to do what we've been taught. You must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. I hope you can. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. Paul's writing to Timothy. In other words, the Hebrew Scriptures. You know, this is solid foundation. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Because he's fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah that were all through, made by the prophets earlier. Then Paul goes on, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. If, this, if the scriptures are the basis of how you make your decisions of what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, what you're going to support and what you're not going to support, then you will have unity, and the church will have unity. The church does not have unity right now because we are not listening to the scriptures. To the clear, intended, straightforward meaning of the scriptures, the unified meaning that goes in the scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The advantage of Ezra and the men that came with us is that they realized that, you know, the scriptures they had, you know, as, as Paul said to them, you've been taught by the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they, they had that as a basis. You know, this was 500 B.C., 500 years, half a millennium before Jesus would, would appear. And they were able to do and, and work together in unity because at least they had that and they realized they would trust it. All scriptures inspired. They knew it. They knew it, it taught them what was right and to do, you know, and, and he knew and they taught them, don't do that because it's wrong. God uses this, it says, verse 17. 2 Timothy 3, 17. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. It gives us the basis of unity to work together and to accomplish things. Now, when Ezra, when we left that off, in the work on the house of the Lord, you know, it was Ezra 4, 24. You know, in Ezra 4, 1, now when the Samaritans, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, heard that the exiles of captivity were building a temple of the Lord, you know, they came, to, they, 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 they rose up and said, well, how can we frustrate that? You know, this, that chapter in there, between those verses, you know, describes the long opposition during those years to accomplish that. They, try, they, they hired lobbyists and frustrate it and do all those things. Just because there's difficulty doesn't mean you give up. And they didn't give up. Let's go to Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1. Now there is a role of leadership and God takes a hand in this too. We see this very clearly in the scriptures in Ezra 5 chapter 1. Then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah the son of Edo prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. You think about the, those prophets that are in there. 
Haggai and Zechariah. They, those things were given to those people at that time to encourage them to continue to do what they were doing in, in spite of all the opposition they were facing and in, in the, in the ticklish political situation they were in. Anyways, the consequences of of the, the teachings by Haggai and Zechariah was this in verse 2. Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, or uh, Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, began to rebuild the house, God's house in Jerusalem. So when it stopped, they said, okay, we'll, we'll just... And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. And at that time... You know, some of the, their opponents, it mentions Tatanai, the governor of the region west of the Euphrates, so he's, he's a member of the Persian government who was opposed to them. And he met, men, mentions another guy, Shathar Bozanai, and their colleagues came to the Jews, and they said, who gave you the order to rebuild this temple and finish the structure? They also asked them, what are the names of the workers who are constructing this building? Yeah, but if it, verse, verse 5 says, But God was watching over the Jewish elders, and these men wouldn't stop until a report was sent to Darius. In other words, you know, they weren't intimidated. And I guess they didn't tell whose names, who was doing what. What they did is, is actually, it says these men wouldn't stop until a report was sent to Darius, and they got a reply, instructions about the matter. So they pushed it up the ladder, said, Oh, they appealed to... You know, to the King Darius, you know, you, we're not going to do this until whatever, you've got to solve this. And obviously their adversaries decided they couldn't push it too far. They couldn't push it too far. If you go to Ezra in chapter 6, you know, they had a search made. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 1, Then Darius the king made a decree, and a search was made in the house of the scrolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Years previously, you know, a previous Persian administration had made a search, and they discovered, you know, when the adversaries had been frustrating, they said, ooh, these people could be bad news. They could rebel. You know, they were used to have powerful kings here. No, 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 no. We, you know, we're not happy about this. But Darius just... Somehow he, um, he made a decree that a search was to be made and they took it more serious and they really did the job. And they found, and they found where it was written in uh, Ezra 6.3. They discovered it was, uh, it was, a record was written in the first year Cyrus, king of uh, Cyrus, the king of C Cyrus. Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of the Lord in Jerusalem that the house be built in the place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations of it be strongly laid and it, it goes on it said you know he, he said yeah they're right they had they had the thing and all of a sudden what happened was you know Darius he wasn't a Christian <laughs> he wasn't a Jew or whatever but because they were unified in their approach they did what they needed to and God did what he needed to do to work out his plan. See, we're not in this alone. God sorts through his people, and then he gives us a vision, but he's, we're not just totally on our own. God is also there working, even behind the scenes in this case, to do something remarkable. Because this goes here in Ezra 6 and verse 15. Well, no, let's start 14. And the elders of the Jews built you know, after this word came by from Darius that he had found this record, and he told all the, he, the local people who were giving them static and trying to oppose them, said, you better, instead of opposing them, help them, that we're going to build the house. And the elders of the Jews built, and they were prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they built and finished it according to the command of the God of Israel, according to the decree of Cyrus and Darius in our taxis, kings, well, the kings of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And it talks about how they would consecrate it and the, how they kept the Passover there. Of course, Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. Let's go to Ezra 6 and verse 21. 
And the children of Israel ate the Passover lamb, all who had come again out of exile, and all such as had separated themselves to them from the uncleanness of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria. Persians were kings of Assyria too, because they had conquered it. But even referring back to early oppressions when God had sent the nation into slavery because of their, the, the sinful nature of what had prevailed in the, in the nation. He turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them to make their hands strong in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. God says very clearly, Jesus would later say in Matthew 7 and verse 13, it was not easy. What these returning exiles went through was not easy. God had made a separation. He had sorted them. You know, who's willing to do it? Who's willing to, you know, and who was not? Those who were willing, they came in the land, were you st still willing. Did you have the vision? Could you, with patience, continue to work it in spite of opposition and keep at it? And eventually they did. God blessed it. Because they had the unity, they hung together. They didn't divide and, and, and end up just being assimilating into all of the surrounding peoples. And they preserved the vision. They reestablished the nation. Of course, that Jesus would be born into the Savior of humanity. It's a, it's a big story, a big part of the story. Jesus says this, Matthew 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, verse 13. He says, enter through the narrow gate. It's, it's narrow. It's, it's, it's a path that's well defined. My preferences are defined. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss, and there are many who enter through it. See, this is symbolic, and that's of our time. To be a Christian right now at this time is difficult. It's not popular. It is to live the narrow gate. But in this sorting process, we can have unity if, if, we have, if we have the vision to act together. And if we continue with patience to do the good things that God outlines for us to do in his scriptures. Just as, you know, before they knew it was their responsibility to properly worship God. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads to destruction and eternal loss. There are many who go enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads the way to everlasting life, and there are few who find it. But in finding it, we need to continue with patience to do what is good and what God outlines for us. We need to continue on. We live in a time of much division. You know, it will continue on. It will get worse. But in the meantime, if we can support and encourage each other, if we have, if we remain faithful to the word of God, then we will have unity. We will strive for this unity and achieve, you know, the harmony among us if we, if, if we follow those things that are the Spirit of God. You know, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, and the self-control. If we follow those things, then we will have unity. Jesus warns us a house divided against itself will fall. There is one way. There is a narrow path. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the gate. This is, these are the words of instruction. God is sorting through his people. Hope to see you there. <laughs>